Hello, I'm Jennifer Hancock, and we're back with the Tampa Bay Community Network's Spotlight on Humanism. I'm the Executive Director of the Humanists of Florida Association, and with me is Margaret Downey from the Anti-Discrimination Support Network, and Babu Goganini from London, who is the Executive Director of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what all you're involved in. Uh, Margaret, you do anti-discrimination work. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that? Well, we are a group that um, was founded in 1993, working very diligently, um, mimicking the work of the Anti-Defamation League. Okay. But we are representing the atheist community. We're very concerned about the discrimination and harassment and stereotyping that's waged against the humanist slash atheist slash free-thinking community. Okay. Anything, what specifically is going on? I mean, give me an example. Well, um, we started with the Boy Scout issue back in 1993, where we were very concerned about what was being taught to the children concerning um, be non-believers. Uh, I was concerned particularly because my son was asked to leave the Boy Scouts after it was revealed that we were a humanist family. Um, I went ahead and sued the Boy Scouts. At that time, the Boy Scouts were a public organization. They have since, in order to avoid discrimination uh, lawsuits, have declared themselves private. So that's one concern we have, because they're teaching children within the Boy Scouts to be intolerant of non-believers. Um, I'm also concerned about recent statistics that um, reveal that non-theist people are um, unable to get elected to public office. Uh, we find that we are the most hated group in America. Um, it's even double the hatred against non-believers or, or humanists uh, or atheists, um, more so than the Muslims. Um, we are also concerned with statistics that show people would be most unhappy if a member of their family married a humanist or non-believer. So these are the types of statistics we want to change. We want to do a turnaround on that. But we also handle cases that come in where people are complaining about losing their job, uh, about um, being harassed in the workplace or in the schools and by their teachers. So we act on cases of discrimination in that manner. Okay, I always, you know, being a non-believer uh, non myself, um, obviously as a humanist, um, it, it seems to me that, that not only are humanists, you know, discriminated against, but we're the last group, the non-believers are the last group that it's okay to discriminate against. Right. Everybody knows it's not okay to discriminate against gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender. Everybody knows it's not okay to discriminate based on race, but it's perfectly okay to discriminate based on religion, or actually more specifically, non-religion, because we've it's... learned to be tolerant of different types of religion, but if someone doesn't believe, oh, we need to worry about that. Right. How do you address that? Well, it's being perpetuated um, through the media. Um, every Sunday, a, um, different ministers get up on television uh, platforms and, and declare that uh, we are dangerous to America. We are dangerous people. We are used as scapegoats. We are blamed for the evils of the world because it's an easy target. And uh, one could just turn on a uh, televangelist uh, on a weekly basis and see the type of hatred and intolerance that's spewed from, from them towards the non-theist community. Um, th there's uh, many, many situations that we can turn over by addressing this problem in the school system, by going and teaching tolerance programs, by ending the myths and the stereotyping, by presenting ourselves with who we are and what we stand for, what we do. Okay, excellent. And Babu? Well, I work for the International Humanist and Ethical Union, uh, which is the worldwide organization for humanism. We have nearly a hundred member organizations, including universities and publishing houses, which are trying to promote this human-centered attitude towards life. If you want to know what humanism is all about, it's interesting to know that all you need to say is it is a philosophy of the human being. Yes. And this is what the IHU does. Okay. And as a non-governmental organization, the IHU has consultative status at the United Nations, at uh, UNESCO in Paris, and the Council of Europe. So the organization promotes the interests of humanists.
and therefore of all human beings. Excellent. And you're also doing some very interesting work or involved in some interesting cases in Pakistan, as I understand. Yes, one of the things we do as an organization is highlight this unholy nexus between religion and state. Okay. Um, this in certain, uh, in some countries will mean that the state is associated with the religion. In some other countries there are vestiges of religious influence on what might look like a secular state. Uh, in some countries this means there are blasphemy laws. Now the case we are working on in Pakistan is the case of a doctor who has been accused of blasphemy and then subsequently convicted and conviction for blasphemy in Pakistan can mean that the death penalty. And what did he do? All he did is allegedly, he denies even this, but allegedly he has said before the Prophet Muhammad had the revelation from Angel Gabriel, he was not a Muslim. This is the equivalent of saying before Jesus Christ there was no Christianity, before the Buddha there was no Buddhism. But for having said this, he is going to be killed. So the IHEU, with all its member groups in 37 countries, and with the representation at the UN, at UNESCO, at the Council of Europe, and our work in the Oslo Coalition on Freedom of Religion or Belief, have highlighted the case and the gross injustice um, and the barbarity uh, of blasphemy laws in a lot of Islamic countries and of blasphemy laws in general. Yeah, it's, I think as an American it's very hard for us to understand that just for saying something, uh, you know, speaking your mind, that gee, he didn't have his revelations until he was 40, so you know, there really wasn't the Islamic faith before this man was 40, so there's really no way he could have been but an, it, you know, a, a Muslim before that. For that thought, I mean, it sounds like he actually was a, you know, not necessarily saying anything against Islam, so much as he was just raising a very interesting question um, and for that he's been sentenced to death. It, you know, for an American it seems very, because obviously our laws... Well, you see, all societies pass through very intolerant phases. Okay. The McCarthy era in the United States was similar. Okay. Mm -hmm. You could not voice your opinion without fear of reprisal. But actually, just recently, just a few years ago, we had religious extremists wanting to pass blasphemy laws in New York City. Can you imagine? The comedians would be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just, uh, in America, luckily we do have freedom of speech, but we must be very careful. As a media personality, some people need to be reminded that yes they have freedom of speech but their duty to the public is to be tolerant and to not spread messages of hate and that's what I'd like to see changed in the minds of media personalities we have a media personality at the present time who has said openly that she will never vote for an atheist now can you imagine if she had said this about I would never vote for a black or I would never vote for a Muslim or a Jew they would have been after her and have condemned her. She would have been fired for having made that remark. But no, because it's targeted against an atheist, she's not even apologized. She's not been reprimanded. Um, she refuses to acknowledge our letters and, in fact, continues to make these remarks. Interesting. So, you know, these are the things we are facing in America. That, um, I think there are other parts of the world which provide more positive examples of how atheists are received. For example, in India, in the south of the country, there is a state called Tamil Nadu, which had a very popular rationalist movement in the 1920s, which culminated in the 50s with the founding of two political parties on the basis of rationalism. And one of them was elected to power. Um, therefore, not every society and not every country is this hostile to, to a lack of belief in a god or to religion. So societies do change mm. and I'm sure the US too will need to reform a bit, especially with this new intolerance towards Islam, uh, which seems rather uh, misplaced because it should not be the intolerance of Islam, but it should be the intolerance of all intolerances. Right. And you cannot fight one intolerance with another uh, form. 
the present state action seems to be rather uh, over the board. Absolutely. I, I always think of, um, you know, I have a saying and people laugh when I say it, but the, I have a right to be intolerant of intolerance. Yes. You know, <laughs> not intolerant, you know, intolerance is not a good thing, but it is good if you're being intolerant of intolerance. And I, I really kind of uh, dislike the word uh, tolerance because it almost makes it sound like you have to hold your nose and you know take it no matter how offensive it is and what I'd like to see is a is a new word you know something like acceptance or something that uh, shows a positive spin to to being open-minded to being accepting uh, is much better in my mind than tolerance right. um, although the Southern Poverty Law Center has a wonderful program called teaching tolerance uh, a, a program that is indeed effective and should be emulated um, throughout the country but um, I want to go forward with more of a positive spin on that I know some um, some of our partners there's a group called or was a group they merged with another one but they were called acceptance dignity love and respect I like it and yes. that kind of said very much humanist values of acceptance dignity love and respect I mean mm -hmm. that's how humanists feel value-wise every day but you see in the public perception of humanists many think that they are very intolerant of religion uh -huh. um, it is of course a caricature of what humanists stand for mm -hmm. uh, essentially because humanists are, yes, they are anti-religious only when religions are anti-human. So it is a pro-human stance when you oppose intolerance, when you oppose inhumanity. But our anger is not directed uniquely towards religion. It is towards anything that offends the dignity of the human being. Right. I, you know, I believe that as a humanist, I believe that people have the right to believe whatever it is they want to believe. So I have no problem with, you know, I have lots of religious friends, Jewish, Christian, Catholic, not a problem with that. They're, they're good people. They're not extremists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're, they're good people. Um, but there, there does seem to be a conflict. And, and a lot of times when, when we interview humanists and we talk amongst ourselves, a lot of our discussion is directed towards the negative aspects of religion. Mm. And I think that does confuse people into thinking that, well, they're anti-religious, but it's not that. It's, there's, you know, with everything there's good and bad, and we're addressing the bad aspects, but that doesn't mean that there's not necessarily some good aspects of and it And when well. I talk to my religious friends, I usually, you know, say, try to find what we have in common, to find the common ground, and then I, I say to them, well, we believe in the same things. We believe in ethics and morality. I just add one more O to my belief system. I believe in good. You believe in God. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. So they do you know, come to me and they understand what I am after is very similar to what they are after. They're, they want peace and harmony in their lifetime. They want freedom. They want uh, ex the freedom of expression and freedom of choice. Most people do, uh, and you know, once you reach that that particular plateau, then everyone seems to be more on brothers and sisters. You know? Absolutely, I agree. So the reason both of you are working um, on issues that involve religious freedom and therefore you know discrimination against the non-religious um, is not necessarily to say, hey, we, there's no religion. We shouldn't have any religion in the world, but more that this is a legitimate life stance that should be recognized along with all of the other life stances. And actually I'm rather pleased that people have found religion because uh, some people need the fear of hell and the reward <laughs> of heaven in order to not hurt or harm other fellow human beings. So for those people I'm glad they found religion. <laughs> <laughs> well that's very interesting I think. Um, in fact we do work in the arena of freedom of religion. But we, we are very interested in promoting the understanding that freedom of religion also involves the freedom from religion. Right. And uh, we are particularly attached to the concept that not only is it freedom to have your belief, but also to have freedom from make-believe. Now religion, unfortunately, because it enters a public arena rather than remain in the private sphere of belief, has the tendency to influence schools, to yes interfere with legislative measures and therefore interfere with human freedoms. One of these areas where there is this trampling of human freedoms is the imposition of myth. For example, in the United States you had 
uh, the imposition of creationism as science. Right. This we want to prevent. This we want not to happen because children have the right to have objective knowledge, not have dogmas, untested dogmas of 2,000 years right. to be imposed on them. So right. there are areas of conflict, but these conflicts are on the foundation of human rights and human values, yes. not on the foundation of hatred. But if we do look at who has been hating who, you would see that the foundations and the fountainheads of hatred have usually their roots and sources in religious attitudes. Yeah. We do have to fight that. Yeah. yeah, I always, you know, when I look back to the history of humanism and specifically the more modern history that, that led to the Enlightenment and whatnot, um, it, it was almost inevitable that religious forces would, would kind of butt heads with the humanist forces because as a humanist you're saying, well, you have the right to think for yourself and, and you can think for yourself. I mean, it, there was a time when, you know, people couldn't read. They had to rely on a priest to tell them what the book said. But as soon as people started saying, hey, if you can read, if you learn how to read, you don't need the priest. Well, if you're a priest and you're making a lot of money off of people paying you to read books for them, mm -hmm. well, that's the last thing. Well, yes, you, it is you very want important. People to hear. It is important to ask why is it that those people cannot read to start with? Right. What is it that led to that social system? where people are not able to read and therefore have to depend on someone else. And people want answers. Uh, when I teach my class at Temple University, um, they always ask me, well, you know, how did the world come about and, and why are we here? And, and they want me to give them these answers. And, and I say to them that science is young, that we don't have some answers that they think that they need. I personally don't think that I need an answer to those questions to live a fulfilled and happy life, but they want those answers. And then I give them the example that the difference between a religious dogma who gives them the final answer, God did this, or this is the reason you are here, is God's plan. We don't have an answer and we fully admit that. We are waiting. We are keeping an open mind. We don't put an ending to the story because we don't know, and we're, we're going to have to be happy with that. Absolutely, and I, I always think of uh, science kind of like if you teach, you know, if a kid asks how do you spell a word, and you give them the spelling as opposed to teaching them how to use dictionary. Mm. You, you really haven't helped them. Learning how to use dictionary is much more important, and science is very much a tool uh, like that to help get knowledge. It's mm -hmm. not that you have the answers already, but it's a method for discovering as best as you can what the world is really mm -hmm. like. Let's move on and talk more about your personal involvement with humanism. How did you become a humanist? You know, why has humanist led you to work on these various things that you're working on? Babu? Well, I'm, I'm actually a third generation humanist. Oh. Coming from India, that might surprise a lot of people. But the tradition of non-belief in India goes beyond the tradition of non-belief in other parts of the world. So it is not entirely accurate to say that humanism dates back to the Greeks or that it dates back to the Indians. It is just founded in human nature. And I just happen to be the third generation of a family which did subscribe to these values. So it was natural for me that I sympathize with the humanist group when I came to know about it. But my moving into the organized humanist movement is not because I'm a non-believer in God. It's because I'm a believer in human dignity. It is because I am interested in human rights and it is because I'm convinced that the most solid foundation for human rights is laid by the values of humanism. Because humanism above all su subscribes to the idea that there are universal values, that we are united by our common humanity. And therefore the f strongest foundation for human rights is offered by humanism. Well. I must tell you that my background is rather unique in that I was born in the South in the 1950s and realized upon observation that um, there was unfair discrimination just because I had a half-sister who was a person of color. She was prevented from swimming in the same pool. She was prevented from using the same bathroom, the same water faucet, riding on the bus next to me. And so I looked at those things and said, why? why is one person discriminated against and the other is, is cherished? And, and of course, a lot of it revolved around 
religion saying that my sister wasn't good enough. And so I began to question very, very early on and um, realized that the only way that we could solve these problems was to consider ourselves one human family. And that was my goal and um, joined the American Humanist Association, became a member of the board and, and I involved myself completely with that passion. Excellent. Thank you very much.